Battle of Trafalgar, fought on the 21st of October 1805, is probably the greatest and certainly most famous British naval victory of all time. The victory by Britain's greatest naval hero, Admiral Lord Nelson, gave Britain command of the world's oceans and undisputed global dominance for the rest of the 19th century. Ever since 1789, revolutionary France had been engaged in a series of wars with several European powers and had thrown up one of the most brilliant military minds and generals the world has ever known, Napoleon Bonaparte. By 1799, he had become de facto ruler of France, and in 1804, he declared himself emperor. And whilst Napoleon swept all before him on the continent, there was one enemy he couldn't quite master. Sitting across the channel, which acted like a moat of some medieval castle, sat France's oldest enemy, England. Bent on defeating the English, Napoleon assembled a huge invasion army at Boulogne, but he had a problem, Britain's Royal Navy. Historically, the French Navy had always vied with supremacy of the world's oceans with the British. But right at this moment, the French Navy was at a disadvantage. Many of its most able officers had been sacked or killed during the French Revolution. And quite frankly, it didn't have the skills or the numbers to take out the Royal Navy. And until it did so, there was no way that a huge invasion force could realistically cross the English Channel. And then in 1804, the very year he crowned himself emperor, things changed for the better for Napoleon. The French formed an alliance with Spain. And finally, with two combined fleets, the French and the Spanish, Napoleon had naval superiority over the British. All he needed to do was either smash the British fleet in battle or divert it away from the English Channel so that his invasion force could cross unimpeded. In March 1805, Napoleon ordered his Admiral Villeneuve to break out of the British blockade in Toulon in the Mediterranean and then make a rush across the Atlantic with his fleet all the way to the Caribbean drawing the British fleet after him and well away from the English Channel. This Villeneuve did, but upon arriving in the West Indies, he found that Nelson was hot on his heels and he didn't fancy his chances against Britain's most maverick, arguably her most successful and certainly her most aggressive naval commander. So he raced back across the Atlantic with Nelson in hot pursuit. After an encounter with another Royal Naval Fleet at the Battle of Finisterre, just off the coast of Brittany in northern France, he decided against heading to Boulogne to assist the invasion force, and instead headed south to the safety of the Spanish naval base at Cadiz. And there he stayed. Napoleon was getting more and more desperate to have his invasion, and having chastised his admiral for cowardness, he ordered Villeneuve to put to sea and then head back into the Mediterranean to once more pull, pull Nelson away from the English Channel. Villeneuve wasn't sure. Where the heck was Nelson? In October, the captain of an American merchantman recently arrived in Cadiz, informed him that Nelson was actually in England. That was the news Villeneuve wanted to hear. And so on the 19th of October, 1805, his combined French and Spanish fleet set out to sea. The only sign of the British was a small frigate that was observing them out at sea. And all that frigate could realistically do was signal to another ship that the enemy were finally on the move. Unfortunately for Villeneuve, the message of his departure wasn't being flagged all the way to England, but to Nelson and his fleet, which had secretly sailed from Britain and was now just 48 miles to the west. Had he known that Nelson was nearby, it is highly likely that Villeneuve would have ignored his emperor's orders. Such was the reputation of Britain's naval hero. Horatio Nelson was born in the county of Norfolk in 1758. During his years of service, he'd already lost an arm and an eye in action. This was a leader who led from the front. In many respects, he could be accused of having a death wish, always seeking to be in harm's way. Indeed, at Trafalgar, he decided to stay on the victory as it led the charge into the French fleet. Standing on the quarterdeck, dressed in his admiral's uniform, adorned with all the honours that he had been awarded over the years. It was almost like he was advertising himself to the French snipers up in the rigging. By 1805, he had already achieved significant naval victories in 1798 at the Battle of the Nile and in 1801 at the Battle of Copenhagen. And it was in that latter battle that when he was ordered to withdraw, he famously lifted his telescope to his blind eye and said, I see no orders. His victories had been achieved through a mixture of planning, aggression and unorthodoxy. In many respects, 
He was on sea, what Napoleon was on land. And interestingly, Napoleon actually kept a bust of Nelson in his private quarters. Nelson's arrival on his flagship, HMS Victory, had electrified the British fleet. Such was the charisma and trust that he instilled. No wonder Villeneuve was not keen to venture out against him. But now Villeneuve was at sea, and just 48 miles away, the confident Nelson set off in pursuit. The Franco-Spanish fleet consisted of 33 ships of the line, 23 of them French, as well as seven smaller frigates. And against that, Nelson's fleet consisted of 27 ships of the line. So whilst the Royal Navy were outnumbered, they did have several advantages. The French fleet was seriously undermanned, and those sailors they did have were nowhere near as experienced as their British counterparts. Moreover, during the preceding years, the Royal Navy had effectively blockaded the French uh, in, into their ports, and this had two effects. First, with the French stuck in their ports, they had limited experience of actually being at sea, and even less experience of gunnery. It's worth pointing out, of course, that while the French were stuck in port, the British were patrolling up and down the coasts of Western Europe and the Mediterranean, improving both their seamanship and their gunnery skills. By the time of Trafalgar, crews on the Royal Navy ships of the line could fire their cannon at a rate of three shots for every two the French sailors managed, and with more accuracy as well. In the sort of battle that Trafalgar would become, that advantage would prove decisive. The traditional battle at the time was fought by two lines of ships passing each other and firing broadsides. Nelson, ever the maverick, had a different plan. Over the previous two weeks, he had held a succession of briefing dinners on his flagship and drilled the bold plan into his captains. And his plan was as simple as it was audacious. He wouldn't play by the conventional rules of engagement. Instead of sailing alongside Villeneuve's ships of the line, blasting away at each other, he decided to attack at right angles. As his ships crossed the enemy line, they would then let rip into the unprotected bows and sterns of the French ships. Not only would this potentially wreck their steering at the back, but the bombardment would sweep straight down their enemy's gun decks, killing their crews and destroying their guns. The downside was that the leading Royal Naval ship would have to bear broadsides as they advanced without being able to fire back. Whilst this approach was unconventional, it wasn't totally unique. It had been done before, but Nelson's plan was to attack at right, at right angles at two separate points, effectively splitting his enemy into three parts. The first squadron, led by HMS Victory with Nelson himself, would attack at about a third of the way along the, the Franco-Spanish line. The leading third of his enemy would then be effectively be cut off from the battle and unable to support their fellow ships until they could effectively turn and come back into the fray. By then, in Nelson's plan, the middle of his enemy's fleet would have been destroyed. And now with ship parity, but superior gunnery, he was confident that the British could win the battle even if that leading third of the Franco-Spanish fleet returned to the fray. In fact, Nelson was so confident that he predicted sinking or capturing 20 enemy ships with this tactic. Remember that number for later. The other squadron of British ships would be led by Vice Admiral Cuthbert Collingwood in HMS Royal Sovereign. Collingwood, who is sometimes forgotten in, in Nelson's shadow, is one of England's most successful naval commanders. He and Nelson had first served together back in 1777 when he was just 29, and their careers have been intertwined ever since. Along with Nelson, he was one of only three Royal Navy commanders to receive three Navy gold medals. And indeed, it had been Collingwood with three ships who had been off Cadiz and had watched Admiral Villeneuve arrive. And then when 16 Franco-Spanish ships gave chase, he managed to actually outmaneuver and escape from them all. At Trafalgar, he was to serve as Nelson's second in command. On the morning of the 21st of October, 1805, the British sighted Villeneuve's fleet just nine miles away. Drummers immediately beat to quarters. The Royal Navy crews were so well drilled that it took them just 10 minutes to clear their decks for action. Sand was strewn across the decks, ammunition was rushed to the cannon, and finally the gun ports were opened and the cannon rumbled forward. Whilst there was a growing swell in the sea, the wind was light, meaning that it was a laborious effort to move him to position. But slowly, ever so slowly, the gap closed. At 11.48, Nelson ordered a message to be flown to the whole fleet. England expects every man 
will do his duty. And as it was relayed from ship to ship, cheers erupted through the fleet. And whilst it read England expects, Nelson's adoring 18,000 sailors at Trafalgar were not just English. Research from the National Archives and the National Maritime Museum suggests that while the majority were English, plus a heck of a lot of uh, Welsh and Scots as well, up to a quarter were Irish. In fact, they've identified 22 different nationalities serving in the Royal Navy at the Battle of Trafalgar, including 360 American-born sailors, 78 Swedes, 115 Italians, 123 West Indians, and even a handful of French and Spaniards fighting on the British side against their own countrymen. HMS Royal Sovereign had recently had a new layer of copper on her hull, which increased her speed, and thus it was Admiral Collingwood, not Nelson, that reached the enemy first that morning. Collingwood crossed immediately behind the Santa Ana, the mighty 112-gun Sp Spanish flagship. From point-blank range, Collingwood in HMS Royal Sovereign opened fire, killing or injuring 400 men and destroying 14 guns, almost in his opening salvo. Swiftly, though, he was surrounded by enemy ships, intent on protecting their flagship and their admiral. HMS Royal Sovereign fought a vicious battle until the rest of Collingwood's squadron caught up with their commander. Shortly after that, the mighty Santa Anna struck her colours and surrendered. In the meantime, Nelson's squadron had finally cut across the fleet. Having been blasted for 40 minutes by four French ships, it was now the turn of HMS Victory re to return fire on Villeneuve's own flagship. The broadside that the Victory fired at 12.35 was so massive that only one man was left standing on the French quarterdeck, Villeneuve himself. French ships now broke ranks to attack the Victory and a general melee ensued. It was now 1.15pm. As he paced the deck of HMS Victory with Captain Hardy, Nelson was struck by a musket ball shot from a sniper in the rigging of the French ship Redoubtable. The musket ball entered his left shoulder, passing through his chest and breaking his spine. He was rushed to the surgeon below deck. Meanwhile, Marines and sailors aboard the Redoubtable, the French ship, gathered ready to storm the Victory. Having been repelled once after vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they prepared for yet another assault on the British flagship. At that very moment, another British ship, HMS Temeraire, came alongside the Frenchman and blasted her top deck with grape shot and lannisters, which were bags of musket balls. Suddenly, the tables had been turned. Within less than half an hour, the Redoubtable surrendered. Her captain was severely wounded, and out of a crew of 643, just 99 were still fit for duty. Around the same time, Villeneuve himself surrendered his flagship. Both flagships of the Spanish and the French fleets had now surrendered. And all the while, news of the battle's progress was being relayed to the stricken Nelson below decks on HMS Victory. And as the reports confirmed Nelson's pre-battle prediction of the number of enemy ships sunk or captured, Britain's naval hero gasped, I'm now satisfied. Thank God I've done my duty. At 4.30pm, with the news of the British victory ringing in his ears, Admiral Lord Nelson drew his last breath. In five hours of fighting, the Royal Navy had destroyed or captured 19 French or Spanish ships without losing any of their own. Remember Nelson's prediction, he was going to sink or capture 20 ships. However, whilst not losing a single ship, the human cost had been high. It's estimated that over 1,500 British sailors were killed or wounded. Having said that, the losses to Napoleon's navy were colossal. Apart from losing two-thirds of their ships in the battle, it's estimated they lost something like 6,000 men killed or wounded, and up to 20,000 taken prisoner. Nelson's body was preserved in a barrel of brandy and brought home to England. And there, in January 1806, he was given a full state funeral at St Paul's Cathedral in London. His tomb in St Paul's Cathedral is open to the public to view and it li lies alongside uh, that of the Duke of Wellington, victor at the Battle of Waterloo. And nearby lies the tomb of Admiral Collingwood, who had taken over command at Trafalgar upon Nelson's death. Nelson and his victory at the Battle of Trafalgar are most famously commemorated in London's Trafalgar Square. The square was named in the 1830s, with the famous Nelson's Column being erected in 1843. 
Nelson was voted ninth in a public poll of Greatest Britons conducted by the BBC in 2002. The Battle of Trafalgar is regarded as Britain's greatest naval victory. Napoleon, however, was not brought down by his defeat at sea. In fact, the very next month, he achieved one of his greatest land victories against the Russians and Austrians at Austerlitz. And in the end, Napoleon was defeated on land at the Battle of Waterloo. And whilst Napoleon had removed his army from Boulogne to march east towards Austerlitz, the destruction of the French fleet at Trafalgar prevented any potential for a future French invasion of Britain. The greatest impact of the victory at Trafalgar was that Britain swept the oceans clear of any rivals for a century. Britannia and the Royal Navy ruled the waves. The greatest impact of the victory at Trafalgar was that Britain swept the oceans clear of any rivals for a century. Britannia and the Royal Navy ruled the waves. And this dominance and her pole position in the Industrial Revolution enabled Britain to become the superpower of the 19th century. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm planning some more talks on Britain's maritime history. Tell me what you'd like to hear about in the comments below. I'm currently working on one about the real story behind the classic film, The African Queen. But in the meantime, keep well, and I'll see you very soon.